Good evening, folks. This is your host, Terry Farley in Dallas, Texas. Now calling to each one of you from the eye of the storm. The eye is at the very center of a hurricane. Regardless of how powerful the hurricane, the eye at the center is calm. God's word leads us to the eye, for the Lord encourages each of us to be still and know that he is God. Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11. Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11. Thank you each and every one very much for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. Welcome to all, especially our new listeners. Uh, Greetings from the eye of the storm. Tonight, we continue our heading for Calm Harbor, our port of call, centered at the very eye of the storm. All other things being equal, we enter Proverbs 29, our third to last chapter of this portion of wisdom literature, praising the Lord for his provision of time and place to delve uh, more deeply into his word. Though we have hardly plumbed the eternal depths available, something we shall be able to do with leisure in the expanses of eternity. And so, with all, delighting to join in our excursion, encouraging those blessed to open their Bibles, we begin with chapter 29, verses 1 through 4. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes his wealth. The king establishes the land by justice, and he who receives bribes overthrows it. Verse 1 reproves those who reject the wisdom of God, hardening in their, their neck, uh, is from where we have derived the caution stiff-necked people. His end is sudden destruction and that without remedy. Verse 2 reveals the people rejoice when the righteous rule. When a wicked man rules, the people groan. These are truths being lived out across the world today. Whoever loves wisdom, verse 3 intones, makes his father rejoice. Conversely, a companion of harlots wastes his wealth, mirroring Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. The rise and fall of kingdoms is described in verse 4. As we learn, the king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. Verses 5 through 8. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. By transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. God is deeply interested in our speech, verse 5, but primarily because it can reflect the essence of our hearts. Flattery, vain and fake admiration, reveals the man who thus flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Sin is revealed as a trap, verse 6 attests, the evil man caught in its snare whereas the righteous path leads to singing and rejoicing. Verse 7 declares the righteous consider the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. One could put it this way, so what? Who cares? What, what's the difference does it make anyway? <laughs> Truth is an amazing thing, being always and forever correct and right. Verse 8 is a perfect example, declaring scoffers set a city aflame. The riots across America itself, um, reporters declaring minor disruptions on camera uh, with cities burning directly behind them, is testimony to truth. Even the second part of verse 8 mirrors truth that wise men turn away wrath when they are funded and supported, not defunded and defanged. Verses 9 verses nine through 12, if a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless, but the upright seek his well-being. 
A fool vents all of his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. Verse 9 enters with a subtlety that causes the reader to reconsider many of the verses of Proverbs. Proposing a wise man, contending with a foolish man, regardless of whether the fool's response is rage or mockery, peace can never be found. A higher step, hidden within the injunction, reveals, let sleeping dogs lie. Plainly, arguing with a fool wins one nothing. Verse 10 allows that the bloodthirsty hate the blameless, which explains why the guilty attack the innocent, while the upright seek the well-being of the blameless. In recent times, venting one's feelings has become not only acceptable conduct, but even expected and encouraged. Verse 11 contradicts this advice, noting it is a fool that vents all his feelings, while the wise man holds them back. The ruler is warned against paying attention to lies in verse 12 because doing so causes his servants to become wicked. Verses 13 through 16. The poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. Common ground is found between the poor and the oppressor in verse 13. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both parties. More advice to the royal personage is bestowed in verse 14, witnessing the king who judges the poor with truth shall have his throne established forever. Debate is continued through the generations on disciplining children or not. Verse 15 makes clear the parent's duty in this regard, declaring the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Present days across the globe, including evidently most countries, if not all, reveal the truth of verse 16, that when the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases. Hope is nonetheless offered as God's word concludes, prophesying, but the righteous <clears throat> will see the wicked fall. Verses 17 through 20. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. A servant will not be corrected by mere words, but though he understands, he will not respond. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Once more, wisdom records truth in verse 17, as advice determines, correct your son, and he will give you rest. And additionally, with affirmation, yes, he will give delight to your soul. Verses 18 of Proverbs chapter 29 was especially formative for this Christian in my early years, the particular revelation being that where there is no vision, the original Hebrew renders vision as more clearly prophetic vision, where there is no prophetic vision, the people perish. Thus we discover that minus God's prophecies, there is no future for people, none whatsoever. The New King James describes the casting off of restraint as the result of no prophetic vision. Whereas the King James goes further, prophesying people perish who have no prophetic vision. One more excellent reason God inspired the naming of our deliverance from this present evil age, as Paul describes in Titus 2.13, our blessed hope. Hope is more exactly translated is anticipation. Verse 19, the servant will not be corrected by mere words, for though he understands, he will not respond. An example came to mind explaining why servants will give an answer to their fellow servants. Working in a warehouse, I needed to know the contents of a box that was sitting on a rack far above my head. As I stood gazing up at that box, a fellow worker, Elias, came up and stood beside me looking up at the box also. 
Without turning to him, my gaze fixed doggedly on the box. I asked him, Eli, what's in that box? Eli, continuing himself to look up at the desired parcel, dutifully replied, I don't know. I can't see inside it. <laughs> Verse 20 notes, do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Perhaps that is another example of haste makes waste. Verses 21 through 24, he who pampers his servant uh, from childhood will have him as a son in the end. An angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Whoever is a partner with a thief hates his own life. He swears to tell the truth, but reveals nothing. Verse 21 advises the developing relationship of a man with his servant, encouraging that he who pampers his servant from childhood will have him as a son in the end. Wisdom is highlighted easily in verse 22. We see that an angry man stirs up strife. Anger stirred becomes fury, abounding the transgressor in sin. Verse 23 shows the damage of pride, bringing a man low, while the spirit of humility gains one honor to be retained. Verse 24 reveals the sadness of the criminal life, observing whoever is a partner with a thief hates his own life. Although he swears to tell the truth, his speech reveals nothing. Verses 25 through 27, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but justice for man comes from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, but he who is upright in the way is an abomination to wicked. More plain speaking from Proverbs as we approach the final three verses of chapter 29, verse 25, declares the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Curious that a word used seven centuries before the birth of Jesus would be the same word used today to describe a primary social concern in the here and now, the word safe. More importantly, as many examples fill the pages of the Bible concerning fear of man, many instances conversely encourage those following God to be strong and of a good courage. The English translation for the word safe, in fact, reads, set on high, reminding of Isaiah's prophecy, they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles, Isaiah 40:31. Perspective properly focused in verse 26 also sheds the light that though many seek the ruler's favor, justice for man comes from the Lord. Again, a clarification of why God is no respecter of persons. He loves everyone and is not willing that any should perish. Finally, Proverbs 29 closes with the admonition, an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and conversely, he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. The Lord willing, next week we approach Proverbs chapter 3, the next to the last chapter in this wisdom book. <clears throat> we now move forward in our Jewish studies this evening to introduce a more forthright presentation of Jesus in obedience to Paul's admonition in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Though Hebrews is specifically addressing the Jewish community, more importantly, studies crafted for the larger reaches of the body of Christ, our Messiah, are thus intended for all who believe in and on the Messiah of Israel. Our portion this evening is entitled, Jesus for Jews. Opening the book of Hebrews, the Jewish central theme of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Yeshua HaMashiach, is made plain, foretold in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 16, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. 
according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 16. And so we consider with Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. None can argue that Moses was not the greatest of the prophets in the Tanakh. The miracles God did through Moses are all divine movements, which could only be manifested by God himself. Verse 2 continues with God's moving, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Can any deny God did not create the worlds in Genesis 1.1? Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his, excuse me, his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And finally, verse 4, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, as Paul writes of all former prophets. Why a more excellent name than they? We turn to Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This was a reading directly from the Tanakh, Isaiah chapter 53. So often hidden in Israel that folks on the street of Jerusalem often identify this passage as coming from the New Testament. Yes, Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah of Israel and the whole world. It reminds me of a blessing that God has given to everyone who blesses Israel. In Isaiah chapter 52, just the chapter before, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. When it says, Blessed on the mountain, 
and the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who brings good tidings. Because he's going to tell Israel, thy God reigns. Yes, even today, even as I speak, though it may not look like it, it may look like chaos in Israel, we have to understand God reigns and he has promised he is going to return to save Israel. Not any other country in the world, not any other city. He's going to save Jerusalem and he's going to save all those in Israel that believe in him. You can go to uh, Revelation chapter 19 and you can read about his return, his return to Israel, his return to set things right in the world, to separate the sheep from the goats. Please consider accepting Jesus as your savior. It's what he desires, it's what he wants. He loves the world, he has given himself for the world, and he has given Israel as a light to the world. You say, well, wait a minute. Israel hasn't been a light to the world. I mean, they've been in all kinds of trouble. They've had terrible things happen to them. The Holocaust being the most memorable in recent uh, times. Uh, you know, how could they be a light to the world? Because God preserved them through the Holocaust. God led them back to their own land, to Israel. <laughs> and he has blessed them and prospered them. The famous writer Mark Twain, back in the 1800s, had a chance to travel around the world. One of the countries that he requested to go to and did was Israel. In those days, it was called Palestine. It had been called Palestine from the time the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple back in 70 AD. It had been called Palestine. And he went there to visit because everybody knew geographically this was the land that at one time had been called Israel. And he went there and he said he couldn't believe it. I'm paraphrasing, but you can find it in his books. He said he had never seen a country so in a land so forsaken Interestingly, I believe he used the direct quote, it forsaken by God. I'm not sure where Twain is today. I hope he accepted Jesus and he's in glory. I would love to meet him if he is. But the point is, that's what it looked like just a little over 100 years ago. And it looked like that before Israel became Israel. When they were, when the United Nations gave that land back to uh, the Jews and they were trying to figure out what they were going to name it, David Ben-Gurion was in, and it's actually on film, you can see it. He's going up the steps to the library in Tel Aviv and he said it was right at that moment as he was climbing the steps because it was his job to give the country, the new land for the Jews to give them a name and he was going and he'd been struggling with that getting all kinds of suggestions and, and he was going up the steps and right in that moment on film you can see it he's going up the steps and God told him you're going to call the name of the land Israel no other people has been chased out of their lands and returned to call it the same name no other country there's no history in the world like that and that's what happened. That's how powerful God is. That's how much he loves Israel because he said in the very first book of the Bible that Israel is the apple of his eye. Even now, countries are going to try to invade Israel and God is gonna destroy them. The Bible teaches on the mountains of Israel. God, when they get there, people are gonna be scared to death, especially in Israel. But on, at that very moment of destruction, God is going to destroy these people that come there. You can begin the journey of that attack. It begins in um, Ezekiel chapter 38 
and 39 as a description. And we've talked about it on our other radio programs before. But the point is, is that Jesus will always protect Israel and he will come back at their very darkest moment. The light of the world will come forward to save them. You know that the Bible is true. You know that all of the prophecies in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, have come true. All of the prophecies in the New Testament are going to come true. You can trust in the Bible. You can trust in the Word of God. If you do not know Jesus, whether you are Jewish or whatever you might be, God died for you. Jesus died for you. You can read it in uh, First uh, John chapter 2. He died for the whole world. Don't let anybody tell you differently. And you can call on him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. And we're all whosoever's, each and every one of us. It doesn't matter of our titles or our position. <clears throat> we're, as, we're as nothing to God, the Bible in, in Isaiah tells us. We're as the dust of the world to him. And yet he died for us. So call on him today while you have the opportunity. The Bible stresses in, um, in uh, Romans, or Hebrews, I'm sorry, chapter 3, three different times, and then in chapter 4, another time, four times, he expresses the importance, as he does in the Tanakh, the importance of that word and of that time period that is recognized the world over as today. Four times he talks about it. Today. If you will not harden your heart, call on the Lord. Thank you for listening. We've got a big announcement coming up next week. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're, we're working out the timing. Um, please check in with us, see what's going on. And uh, we thank you very much for listening. And uh, until Jesus shouts, <laughs> which could be today, oh, I wish, praise the Lord. Uh, I say what they said in the old days, Maranatha. And that's the wrap for this evening, folks. May we all join together in prayer that each of us has a good night. And the Lord willing, until we meet next time, or until Jesus shouts and we meet in the air, or at supper, here's bidding you all, each and every one, the very best Jesus has to offer you. From the eye of the storm, this is your host, Terry Farley bidding you a good evening.